Good morning. To conclude our lecture of the spiritual life and the family, we focus our attention today on the children and their spiritual life. According to the teacher, the teachings of the elder, Saint Paisios of Monathos. One day, the elder was sitting outside his cell, or his kalini, as he would call it. And as he sat there, one of his spiritual children came up to him and said, Yaruna, if a mother gives holy water to her child and he spits it out, what should she do? And immediately, the elder turns around and said, she should pray for her child. Maybe it's the way she gives the holy water to the child that's causing a reaction. In order for a child to be on the path of God, his parents must be living a proper spiritual life. Some parents who are religious strive to help their children become good persons, not because they're concerned, but because they are concerned about the salvation of their souls. We have parents who go through the mechanics of bringing their children to church just to bring them to church. But then we have other parents who bring their children to church for the real reason, for their spiritual growth, their spiritual nutrition, nutrition, and to be one with our Lord. In other words, according to St. Paisios, he tells us, they tend to be more concerned about what other people will say about their children instead of whether or not their children might go to hell. But then, how can they expect God to help them? The point is not to force the children to go to church, he tells us, but to help the children to get to know how to love the church. Children shouldn't feel pressure to be good. They should feel the need to be good. The parents' holy life informs the children's souls. They then naturally follow their example. Children mimic their parents from a very early age. If they see good, they'll do good. If they see evil, They'll know nothing else but to do evil. As such, they grow up with a devotion and with help both flesh and spirit, without emotional traumas. If parents, out of fear of God, encourage their children, God helps, and the children are helped. But if they do this out of ego, to show off, then God, he tells us, will not help. Many times children suffer because of their parents' pride. And then another spiritual child of the elder had asked St. Paisios the question and said, some mothers ask, what prayers should they teach the child if the child is three or four years old? Now, imagine for a moment for us who have children that are three years old or four, year, four years old. What prayers would you teach your child? A very simple prayer that they could remember. And the elder turns around and he also tells them, you are the mother, 
Try to find out how much your child can handle. As a parent, we do the same. We try to find out how much our children can handle. And they shouldn't be given some outrageous, well, I shouldn't say outrageous, but some long prayer that a three-year-old isn't even able to repeat words that he can't pronounce. And again, he's asked, yeah, no, no, do you think children ought to be brought to all night vigils? Now, let's stop for a moment and think. We as parents, we want to bring our children to church, number one. But number two, to bring our children to an all-night vigil, many of us have tried. We'll take anastasy, for example. We begin the vigil of anastasy at 11 o'clock, and we bring our children, whether they're one, four, eight, nine years old. At 11.30, the child becomes restless. By quarter to 12, the child either falls asleep in the pew or begins to cry because he's overtired. The elder tells us it's better to leave the child home to rest and bring him in the morning for orthros and the divine liturgy because the child will get more out of this instead of the all night vigil. A child needs his rest, he tells us, in order that he may attend or they may attend the orthros and the liturgy. Mothers should teach their children to pray from an early age without forcing them. And he said, villagers in Cappadocia lived the ascetic tradition to the fullest. They would go to the ascetic cells of the saints where they would do metanias and pray with tears in this way they also taught their children to do the same. And then when the Turkish invaders came, they would come at night and they would rob them and they passed by the chapels and they would hear the children crying and the Turks and the robbers were puzzled at what was going on. And they would say, why are you crying? And then they realized that they were praying. And they would turn around, he said, and they would begin to laugh and mock the Christians in their churches. Because no matter what time of day it was, morning, noon or night, these people would be in their churches crying all day because this was their prayer room. They couldn't understand what was going on, so thus the Turks would mock the Orthodox, he said. And he continued to teach his spiritual children who gathered around him in their at his Kalibi and said, Miracles happen with the prayers of little children. Whatever they ask of God, God provides. Because they have innocence and God hears the prayers of those who are pure. And he said that he remembered one time when his parents had gone to the field and left him and his two younger brothers, and suddenly the sky had darkened, and it began to rain. And it rained so hard that he said it was 
a torrential storm. And he recalled that they prayed, what will become of our parents? How will they get back home? And he wrote that his two younger brothers began to cry. And he said, come, let us pray to God and ask our Lord that the rain will stop. The three of them knelt and prayed to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he said, for the rain to stop in order that his parents would, be, would return home safely. And in a few minutes after they prayed, their prayers were answered and the rain stopped. With discernment, discernment, parents should help their children from a very young age to draw near to Christ and to experience from that young age the higher joys and the spiritual ones. And when they start to go to school, they should teach them little by little to read, not just their school books, he tells us, but also to read spiritual books. And what are the spiritual books? One, the Bible. Two, a book of prayers for small children to recite. And as they grow older, not only will they learn to recite the prayers from these small books for children, but they'll learn to learn, they'll learn to grow spiritually. And they'll become, as he says, angels in their prayers. And they'll have greater boldness before God. Such children, he says, are a spiritual investment for the family. Specifically, he says, they should read the lives of the saints because this will greatly assist them in their spiritual life. And he said that he recalls when he was little, he would take those little books with the lives of the saints that were available in those years when he was a child. And he would go out into the woods to study them. And there he would pray. And while he was reading, he would remember how much joy would overcome his being. From the age of 10 to 16, when the Greek-Italian war broke out, he lived a carefree spiritual life. Childhood joys are pure, he tells us. They leave a lifelong imprint on a person. And then he tells us that person will find himself or herself very moved by the memory of these childhood recollections when they're older. If children live spiritually, he tells us, they will live joyfully in this life. But most of all, they will rejoice spiritually in the life to come, in the presence of Christ, in the kingdom of heaven. But then it brings us to our next point relationships with friends. Another young monk asked St. Paisios and said, Yeranda, a woman asked us what should she do about her two cousins who have been living off of her like parasites for years. 
And his response was very simple. What does she want? Should we come up with a new gospel for her? God has asked her to help her cousins, and he will do whatever is beneficial for their souls. And immediately, the young monk said, Yeronda, when there is a misunderstanding among relatives, should someone intervene in order to help them? And St. Paisios writes, of course, someone should say something discreetly, because if he keeps silent, he may cause further harm. If by doing this, he is misunderstood, he should go once again to say, please forgive me for upsetting you. Following that, he should leave them alone and pray for them. If one wishes to live, live peacefully, he must be especially careful with his relationship with his relatives and with his friends. One mustn't be fooled by politeness. and be conned by your kindness. Worldly politeness can be very harmful because it contains hypocrisy. One's external behavior may sim simulate the perfect saint, but when his inner self is revealed, the ulterior motives, we say, it may be complete opposite. A sheep and wolf's clothing. And immediately, you always have the response from somebody, and in this instance, a young novice said to him, Yeronda, when someone feels the kindness of another, is it right to acknowledge it? And St. Paisios writes, it isn't necessary if they're a close friend or relative, because he too will have a bit of assistance to him, be, being aware of their inner gratitude that exists between them. In other words, they know the kindness that is being shared between the two, that you don't always have to think that and be think back. But if they are not close related, then, he tells us, he should express his gratitude in every possible way. To strangers, we say thank you. If, let's say, a child wants to express his gratitude to his parents, he should do nothing else but say constantly, day and night, thank you. Thank you for everything you do for me. Now let's pause for a moment and stop and think for a moment. Our own children today, do they stop and thank us every day for everything we do for them? Do we stop and say thank you for everything that our parents have done for us? It's something to think about. We should practice what we preach. It's very helpful to be simple in our relations with others, to always have good thoughts about them, and to not talk everybody to be serious. One should avoid discussions which are presum presumably held for spiritual improvements. But we should always avoid speaking ill of people. And St. Paiso tells us because it brings nothing but headaches to a person. 
One shouldn't expect spiritual understanding from people who don't believe in God. Ever talk to somebody who doesn't believe the way we believe? Or believes in our faith? It's better if one simply prays for them that God will forgive them and will enlighten them. One should speak the language of each person. In other words, don't speak above a person's level. Speak to their level. Be their equal when you speak to them. Don't be condescending to the person, St. Paisios tells us. And not reveal the great truths that he believes and experiences. Because they will not understand what you are saying when you speak above them. But rather speak simply with love in your heart. In this way, they will understand what we are saying. And St. Paisios tells us that some people may say, I want others to know Christ like I know him. And so they act not as a friend, not as, as an equal, but as a teacher. But to do this, their life has to be in accordance with what they are teaching. When they live, when the lives they lead teach a different life. Other than what they are teaching, they're condemned, he tells us. We need to teach a Christ centered life. In order to do so, we have to live that lifestyle. And if one does not have inner practical experiences, he will be outside the realm of reality and sooner or later will be betrayed by his own self. When we approach someone with pain and with true love, then this true love of Christ transforms over to our neighbor. The person who's, who has holiness, no matter where he is, somehow creates an electromagnetic spiritual field around himself and influences those who come within our love and gives our heart away so easily, because many times people will exploit our heart and turn it into ground meat, as he writes. Or at other times, they aren't able to understand us, and unfortunately, they'll misinterpret what we have to say. And finally, We'll conclude with the topic of temptations on holy feast days. And again, one of St. Paisios' spiritual children came and asks, Yeroda, why do temptations often occur on feast days? And St. Paisios writes, Don't you know, on holy feast days, our Lord Jesus Christ, his mother, the Panagia, and the saints are most joyful 
treating us with blessings and spiritual gifts. If parents offer treats when their children celebrate their name day, and kings grant amnesty when a new prince is born, why shouldn't the saints also offer treats? In fact, he writes, the joy they give is very powerful and very beneficial to the souls. Knowing this, the devil creates temptations in order to deprive people of these divine gifts and prevents them from rejoicing and benefiting from these feast days. And he continues in his writings and says, and you can see sometimes when a family is preparing to go to church to receive Holy Communion on a feast, that the evil one will come and cause them to argue. And for some reason, they end up not coming to church or coming late to church and missing Holy Communion. The devil will do whatever he can in order to prevent the family, to prevent the Christian, to prevent that spiritual child. All he can do from celebrating on that feast day he will deprive him of all the divine help there is. St. Paiso says, you also see this in the monastic life. Many times the devil knowing full well that the monastics will benefit spiritually on a feast day that he will create a temptation, a spoil that he is, a spoiler that he is, he writes. On that day, or rather from the night before, and he will spoil the entire feast for all the brothers and sisters, the nuns rather, in the monasteries. And he gives an example that he may get us, and he's talking now amongst the monks, that the devil may get the monks to argue with one another. Brother and torment us, or br br brother and torment us afterwards by breaking our spirit emotionally and physically. But God because he's a good God, will help us if we turn to him, if we don't allow the devil from preventing us from praising God by glorifying God and praying to God. And God will help us, he says. He will see that the temptation was caused solely by the envy of the evil one, will not allow him to provoke us. And God may help us even more if we humbly reproach ourselves, blaming neither a brother nor the devil himself who hates every good. For after all, this is what he does. He creates scandal and spreads evil, whereas man is the image and likeness of God. And therefore, we should spread peace and goodness. I remember when I went to seminary, And we were taught that 
the holy hill, the holy cross, the chapel, was the devil's playground. And that we should be vigilant in our prayer. And the same is said in our churches. That where else does the devil come to tempt us? But here, in our churches, which is our spiritual hospitals. And it's here that we fight the good fight against the evil one. There's a story, and I'll conclude with this, of a holy monk that lived alone in the desert. And the devil told his little demons to go out and to destroy this monk who was so holy and pious and humble. And these demons went night and day to try to break this monk from this spiritual rule of this prayer life. And they couldn't do it. No matter how hard they tried, and they returned to the devil and said, we can't break his spirit. And the devil said, you're doing it all wrong. And he said, let me show you how it's done. And immediately the devil went to this monk's cell and he saw the monk praying peacefully in the corner without distraction. And he went up to the monk's ear and said, your brother so-and-so just became patriarch. And immediately the monk stopped praying. Got up with anger and a frown on his face couldn't believe it. And the devil turned around and told his fellow demons and said, this is how you get them. Envy and jealousy. And St. Paisius tells us and that we should be on guard and not allow the evil one to come, as he wrote, to provoke us against one another, but always to give praise to God. And God will come and will help us and aid us to overcome the temptations of the evil one and will help us along the path to spiritual growth. So we will be able to conquer the world. Amen.